Welcome to How Rugby Made Me, brought to you by our brilliant friends, good partner, British Airways. I'm Mike Tyndall, I'm back up in God's country, my hometown of Leeds, to meet a very, very good friend of mine. He's a legend of both sides of the game, league and union. He's known for his electric feet, his incredible acceleration, and there's pretty much nothing he hasn't won in either codes. 20 years on since scoring that try in 2003, He's invited me to his first ever club to have a little meander down memory lane. So welcome everyone to the Hunslet Club. Let's go inside and meet the one and only Jason Robertson. Now, we are in the summer holidays, so there is a kids club on. So we've had to go into a very different room than you would expect, but let's see how it goes. Well, we're back, the Hunslet Club. Yeah. It's been amazing to get here from, walk, from driving into the car park Obviously, I, I imagine it's changed from the first time you were here, but you know, the pitches on the other side, walking in here, it's got that sort of youth club vibe. Obviously, we are in the boxing ring. There's yep. table tennis tables, there's pool tables, yep. and there's obviously the boxing ring, there's football trophies, there's rugby trophies. There's everything. Look, is that what it was when you first got here, the, the place where it, it gave you the first taste into everything sporting? And the, This place hasn't changed. It's the same building, you know. We're we're here now in the in the boxing ring, and obviously I'm Go on, known did you, for. Did you step in here? Yeah, we had no choice. You know what? Why do you think I'm fast? Because I couldn't <laughs> box. <laughs> Dear me! Like as you're walking here, you can't. It's a bit smaller pitch, isn't it? So that's oh, where you got man. your fast feet from. Yeah, no one can it's, catch it's, you. it's not the same pitch. when you're jumping out of the ring just to get away from people. <laughs> but what what you can't see now is, as you walk in, they used to be um, flats. Um, just just at the side here, and it went. It was a big project, big housing, housing estate, and uh, dear me, it, it got condemned. I think after twelve years, so it was one of the worst projects ever. <laughs> and it's you know there's some of the <laughs> some of the toughest people um, in this area used to live there. But because um, this was on our doorstep, as a I think I came here when I was about five or six. We used to just walk here because we had somewhere to go. Yeah. You know, this was, and, and still is, a, a tough, tough area. Yeah. And one of the great things about the club was, it just welcomed everybody in. We didn't have any money. You know, I, you know my story anyway. I did my father there guiding me, my mum was a cleaner. But all the kids used to be drawn down to here because we could come and play pool. You know, we could run around the hall, we could start rugby, we could do a bit of boxing. And uh, Dennis, who's run this play, I think since 1971. It's 50 year, man. You couldn't find a nicer person. Yeah. You know, I didn't get invited in because he thought I was going to be a good rugby player. Yeah. You know, there, there's so many people that have come through and done some amazing things, but everybody is welcome. And they find something for you to do. And I started out, as I say, we would do, he used to bring us in here because there was a, kids, a lot of kids with a lot of anger, a lot of, yeah. lot of stuff going on. And instead of everybody just getting stuck into each other on the car park, it's like, well, you want to fight then? Yeah. Come on then, get in the ring. Let's see how tough you are. So, and that, so, that is a completely different thing when you get in the ring. It sounds like Dennis sort of understood the area. I mean, it was, is he a local, yeah. local guy? But it sounds yeah. like he understood the area, understood the kids. And, yeah. You know, you know, probably helped your mum out as well, and giving, having a place that she was comfortable you, get, you go into and she could get on with. But where, where do you go? Yeah. Where do you go? All, all, yeah, if you haven't got anywhere to go, the kids will just traumatise people, go up to mischief, break windows, just do, do hang all. Around to, hang around together and get bored. Yeah, well, and you know what that uh, what that brings. But uh, but this this was great. I mean, the the place from the outside hasn't changed one yeah. bit. Has it managed to keep the same fields? Uh, they the same size, or have they shrunk? Or we didn't have those fields. The, the, oh, the pitch right. I used to play on. It's just over near the uh, railway station. So we had to walk over the road to the pitch. Right. Um, so growing up, I, I started at the Hunslet Club and then um, played for a few years here. Went to Hunslet Park side, which is a few miles um, up the road. And then what's happened over the years is because of the challenges, you know, everybody's face and money, they, they've all merged. So now there's, there's three clubs as one, which is which is fantastic. Yeah. So all the pitches are, are accessible. There's more facilities, and and they're looking after more and more kids. And as a result of that, they, everything's sort of thriving. The the, the, the numbers, because there's so many clubs that are struggling for numbers. And, and what Dennis has, has done so well with the Hunslet Club is, 
instead of just sit back and always just looking for funding, they've, they've, they've done it themselves. And there's, there's an educational program here, you know, that where kids are being kicked out of school, where do you go? So they've done an educational program here. They teach them joinery, woodwork, and then they've invested in some houses that have been, you know, that needed doing up. And they've got the kids to go and work on the houses to yeah. get them up to a standard then. The and it might be a single is. mother yeah. that needs a house. And so now she, so yeah. they do some amazing things and they do um, events in the hall. They've turned the hall. I mean, yeah. one, one day it's it's a hall for kids to run around. Yeah, like today. The, the, the next day it's it's full of uh, punch bags and, and they'll do circuit sessions for, for, for all kinds of people, kids, adults. Um, and then, you know, the, the weekends or in the evening, you know, they, they bring all the lights out and the drapes and, yeah. and everything else. And it's, and it's a it's venue to, to raise some money. So, so they've been very proactive in that. And, uh, but it's, it's, I, I love coming back because it just reminds me where it all started, who I really am. You know, take away all the glitz and the glamour and the World Cups and everything else. This is me. This is, this is, this is Robbo. J-Ro. J-Ro. Did it take long to realise that rugby league was the, was the sport for you or, or was it... <laughs> Well, you'd obviously run out of here, out of the boxing ring. Oh, and you don't realise. You just run to the pitch and listen, then you stayed there. Listen, you don't realise how many people love to fight around this area. Just, just love to fight. For me, <laughs> that was the last option. <laughs> <laughs> that was the last option. And yeah, there's, there's some boxers here, you know, that have gone on to, you know, to do, do really well. But yeah, I wanted to. I realised early doors, boxing wasn't for me. So it was a case of right, well, we'll, we'll just try rugby and. Uh, you know, the rest is history. It was an instant success. Um, won, a, won a few awards here. I think you've, I think you've actually got a picture of. Yeah, the you know, so I brought I brought Gary a couple of pictures Schofield. to show you because um, over the years there's was, there was a few players because my obviously my background was rugby league and there's a few people um, that inspired me to play. So and were part of um, in and around Hunslet, Hunslet Club, Hunslet Park side, and I've got this picture here with. Uh, me collecting award and the, the, the great Gary Schofield, Leeds, I mean, I Leeds to, legend, yeah, Great to, Britain. I used to obviously watch Leeds a fair bit and he was Skips and then he was at uh, Great Britain. Um, oh, and he, he was a legend of the game and for me and for all the other younger players to, to see him and to see that he has gone on to do something amazing. We just wanted to be like him. So for me to be able to get the, I think it was a player of the year that I'm getting there, and to be presented that by him was, was just amazing. It was just amazing. Threads are looking tight too. And mess about there. That's <laughs> some nice it. slacks on. Yellow and a grey nice slacks. Yellow, 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 yellow grey jumper. jumper. It's, it's tight. I've got another picture here, and this is, this is me playing at, at Headingley. Um, I think it was a seven aside tournament. But and that's I, Hunslet Park, right? This, so, so, yeah, so this was a sevens tournament. And for, for any child to play in a major stadium, was, was massive because yeah. I was a ball boy at, yeah. at times as well. But I always wanted to play for Leeds. It's my hometown club. Everybody in this place wanted to play yeah, for yeah. the Leeds Rhinos. And I, I, I look at this and I just think, that it's amazing. You, that was my dream. And sometimes it's, it's, it's good to not always get what you want because... <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it, it, it sort of worked out. They didn't want me and they chose somebody else. So I then sort of switched direction and went went to Wigan. So then the journey you played all your rugby league up here, did it then go through a trials process to go to Rhinos or how, how was the process of the development at that point through rugby league? I don't think there don't, was always, I don't, I don't know, they always just seemed to be barriers. I, yeah. I just, I don't know, I don't know if it was my childhood, there always was something like trying to pull me back, yeah. whether it's home life, whether it was really going for trials. The, the highest I ever got to amateur level was county. I played for Yorkshire a few times, but then when I went to play for um, England, didn't get in. Yeah. I didn't have the connections. Uh, yeah. There was lots of players I was playing against. Their dads were the scouts, their dad yeah, were this. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it just seemed that it just wasn't meant to be. And then I went for some trials at Leeds and, and, and did all right, but they decided to, to choose somebody else um, over me. And I, I look back and at the time I was a bit, you know, probably a bit annoyed, but I look back now, I think it was probably the best thing yeah. that could have ever happened because Leeds Rhinos um, at that time, great club, but never achieved anything. Yeah. 
that then paved the way for me. Um, there was a scout in Leeds, a Wigan scout in Leeds called Eric Hawley, and he was the one that got me to Wigan. So I signed up Wigan um, as a 16 year old. And, uh, and then I went over and lived there full time at the age of 17 and, and then went on this journey with, you know, the, the, yeah. the sort of famous Wigan team in the 90s and, and dominated everything. You obviously said there about people, parents being scouts and this and that. Was, you know, with your family with as much sporting history or? <laughs> oh, I know Absolute your dad. Absolute zilch. Zilch. No, but I, I can remember my brothers, I've got two older brothers, I can remember them playing one football match ever and I was going to watch them. I mean, he ended up scoring a goal. Like, but I'd literally, <laughs> like literally, the line was there, the goal line, and, and he must have just kicked it about three centimetres. Like, and it was a muddy day, it was awful, it was raining. One of my other brother didn't want to get out of the car. He was sat in the back of the car, it was raining, he didn't want to come out, so he was just sat in there smoking. And that is the only time I've ever seen my siblings play sport. Mm -hmm. So, so nothing, no, no uncles, no, no family members ever did anything. So what was the attraction for you? Was it, did, did it hit you on so many levels or did you just realise I'm actually really fast and I'm actually quite good or, or was it something you actively wanted to do or, you know, or was, you know did it just, it, it came here, it fell on your lap, you found stuff you were good at and you went, well, actually, I'm enjoying it whilst being good at it. I didn't really have a plan for it. It just, just kind of happened. And at the time, I think I was, personally, I was going through a lot of stuff and, Saw a lot of stuff as a, as a child and had lots of anger and, and, I don't know, lots of feelings that I needed to deal with. And rugby was just a great way to get rid of a lot of stuff. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I was one of those, I was pretty um, shy growing up and pretty quiet, but I had a lot of stuff going on. And I just found with rugby, it just, it just gave me an outlet. It was brilliant. You could hit people and it was legal and... There was a there was a discipline side to it, and there was a sense of belonging, and you know I built a bit of resilience up over over time. But all of a sudden, instead of instead of sort of always being told you you're too small, you're not this, I started to get a few pats on the back, and it was like, oh, well done. Honestly, I can't tell you how much of a difference that makes because mm. some people just. Some people take it for granted that you, you you know you go out in the morning to school, you come back, you know you sat down. How was your day? Bloody bloody blah, blah, blah. You got a meal made for you. You this and that. And you, do you know what I mean? You, yeah. Most of the kids around here and where I grew up, that wasn't the case. It's a lot of the time it's it's kind of fending for yourself, and 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 we we had to do a lot of stuff lot of stuff ourselves. So you didn't always get you know the praise to kind of lift you or inspire you or... So just getting that as a, as a rugby player at a young age was, was, was brilliant because I wasn't academic. I just, I, I, I wasn't one that really enjoyed school. But all of a sudden I, I started to be good at a sport and I was getting a little bit of attention. Which, which brought positive feedback, which yeah, makes which, you feel good or, about or, yourself that makes you want to play more sport. More e e exactly, and I played, you know, I didn't just play rugby. I, I played, you know, I played every sport. I used to love tennis. I was a high school champ at tennis. I was a Crown Green bowling champion for two years. Stop, stop, stop it. I'm telling stop you, it. people don't realise. I was Crown Green bowling champ, two years on the trot. And fair play to the old guys at the, uh, the Crown Green bowling play. <laughs> because it's like, well, how do we get like young kids around here playing Crown Green bowling? Because normally you'd see them with their flat caps yeah. on it. It's actually a lot of fun. I know, Crown somebody Green. must have had a great idea. I know, let's put some money on it. So all of a sudden, me and my mates <laughs> knew we could go and win. I think it was two quid prize money. But when you, think, when I back think, in the day, think, when sweets were only half a I pence. I think a smart company once said it always matters more when there's a bit of cash. Oh, on. I'm telling you, so I won it for two years on the trot. So, uh, <laughs> but, but it was. What, what was, I'm intrigued by this now. How much training did you put into this? Oh, we loved it. We loved it. We used to go up to the park because the park was everything. Like any opportunity, you come home, you put your bag in, you go to the park. Everybody would meet at the park. Everything happened. Cross Flats Park, it's not far from here, but everything would happen at the park. And depending on 
time of the year, if you know, there's, there's a lot of Asian kids around, Pakistani kids, um, and they love cricket. So depending on what time of the year, if the cricket was on, we'd go up to the park and it was cricket. Yeah. And we'd have to play and try and beat them at cricket. Or if you were lucky, um, one of my mates had a golf, a golf club, he had a seven iron. So we would make the park um, the golf course. So um, we would dig holes. Seeing health and safety issues here, but and listen, listen. We there was a few stray balls. <laughs> it was way before. It was way before those yeah. days. So the seven iron, and we used to like dig holes certain places, and we used to do our own thing. And so there was balls flying everywhere, obviously yeah. through windows. And, and but then Wimbledon was on. You know, we'd try and find a tennis racket, and uh, and we go out and we just play tennis all summer. So it was uh, sport. Just became something that I didn't watch much sport. But I used to just love, love playing it. So then, do you think that by, I know you always wanted to be a rhino, but by having to move and get away, do you feel if you'd have played for the rhinos, would, would this and the, the life that you lead been a bit too close on the doorstep? Do you think actually going to Wigan uh, made you change the way you think you had to go fit in in a, diff in a very different yeah. place, Lancashire? Very different. Very, very different. Yeah, they're not like they're us. A bit, they're a bit weird over Yeah, there. it's the other side, isn't it? Yeah. People don't realise the rivalry between Yorkshire and yeah. Lancashire. Um, yeah. You know, and especially got like Wigan as well. Um, yeah. You know, it's, 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 it's a rugby town. And the great thing for me was probably the change that I needed. You know, no disrespect, there's some great people around here. Um, but there was also a, a lot of things that could have held me back. So well, going you just over, talked about it, hadn't you? you yeah. felt like something was always pulling you back. When you cut the cord. Yeah. Um, but, but it was, dear me, was it a change? You know, I signed for Wigan at 16. I'm full-time at 17. I've got my own house in Wigan, mortgage. I mean, it was, I've always I've never been brought up in a house that has ever been owned by a family yeah. member. At 17, I'm over playing for Wigan. And I own my own house. And... You know, I was full time and all I was doing is playing rugby. And I always remember just just going to Wigan and seeing all the bloody stars there. You know, Sean, I mean, the Sean Edwards, the Andy Farrells and um, Dean Bells, Martin Afires of, of the world. And I was just like, wow. Do you know what I mean? You go from playing at one level to all of a sudden being at the, the biggest club in the world. Um, and then within a year, I go from playing in the academy, handful of games in the reserves, to then the, the next year I was in from the off. Somebody got injured and I was in and I went on a on a journey, to 10 year journey with, with Wigan and we bloody did some amazing stuff. Yeah. Amazing stuff. Enjoyed yourself on the way. Because you, I, I, I was talking to Shira, our producer about this today. You enjoy yourself. You pop back over every now and then because I always talked about ten p a pint. Uh, roof, roof ten, pence, ten pence a pint night. That that nearly was the death of me. Ten pence a pint night. Because well, um, that was that was fight night. Because if you lo lose your cup that cost you five quid, your plastic cup, then you had to go steal someone else's, and no one's giving that up for not, free. Not a chance. Um, I mean. I joke about it now, but... <laughs> <laughs> Rooftops, it was into horrific. Casanovas. It was horrific. Ten pence a pint night. I do, and it wasn't even... It wasn't don't, even don't even know what we were drinking. I do, it, it certainly Definitely wasn't... It wasn't like No, no, I think it was straight out the toilet. I think there was a... There was a <laughs> they were just feeding it, it back like in. The whole week, that, that at the end of the night, where they emptied the, the, like the dregs oh, tray, they'd pour it back in the kegs. <laughs> don't. And that was what you were... Don't have it, but yeah, and I mean, it was back in the day. That was that was a culture. It yeah. was it was more, you know, let's let's enjoy it, let's go out. And I suppose because I was living on my own, I, I, you know, Wakefield was only one of the stops in the week. I was, it might have been Tuesday Liverpool, Wednesday Oldham, Thursday Wigan. I, I just went on a tour all week until match day, and then uh, somehow I, maybe it's because of youth and managed to do it for yeah. for, for a few years, but uh, yeah, certainly certainly took its toll. It was a bit looser in, in those early days, wasn't it? Especially you, your earlier days. There's you no know, cameras. There's no cameras. So no cameras. There was no uh, you know the boys on a bloody Thursday night, Wednesday night, half six, seven seven p.m. stood on tables dancing, wasn't the norm. But nobody had a camera, so you were, you were sort of all right. Yeah. Obviously, you played with the great Twigamala, who who played a bit of a bit of a. Would you say 
with everything he brought, a different side that he brought to you, and I would say he's quite a calming influence, wasn't he? Mm. The great man. But in terms of settling you down a little bit, did it, did you get more professional off the back of, you know, having the likes of him around you and how he spoke and what he talked about, and just making the switch from rugby league to rugby union, the the due diligence you did around the game, which I always say is one of the greatest things about you. In, you know, your physical specimen is one, and what you can do with your feet is, was it was a natural given that you worked hard on. But then the kicking game, understanding rucking, and understanding how the game works, takes a completely different side of, of actually mm. looking, watching. By having that sort of control that you learned, because you made an active life choice to change, didn't you? And yeah, and that, and that was, you know, if, if, if you look at the bigger picture and think, well, I'm, I'm a council kid. I come from very little. So my first job coming out of school as a 15-year-old, I'm, I'm cleaning metal. That was, you know, the path my take sport out of the way. That's where I was going. So all of a sudden, within a, a year, you saw, you know, you, you're signing for Wigan, the biggest club in the world. You're full-time at 17. 18, you, you know, you're playing at Wembley, you're playing for Great Britain, all these different things. People don't realise just how much of a change that is. Like, how does your character change? Your character can't change that quick, but I didn't have anybody to teach me about pressures, about ha handling money, about handling fame. All of a sudden, you go from walking around the streets here where no nobody's nobody's really bothered yeah. to all of a sudden, you, you're walking out of Wembley. Yeah. You know, that's that's huge. And walking out of Wembley as a, as a young boy. So I go through that and everything just happens so quickly. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in the papers, I'm playing at Wembley, I'm playing for Great Britain, I'm play, you know, and got money in my pocket. Well, how do you deal with that? How do you, all of a sudden, you know, as the money rolls in, you become better looking. Yeah. You know, and you get a lot more attention. Um, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Do you know what I mean? Round the streets, I didn't get looking here. All of a sudden, you know, I started to earn a bit of money in Wigan and bloody hell, it certainly uh, looked a lot better. But, but there was loads of challenges. Who, who, who's around you? Why are they around you? Do they want to yeah. just be with you for profile and you know to suck the life out of you? And I, I just didn't. Even, I was blown around like a, a bloody leaf. Yeah. The environment that we're in. I mean, it's tough. I'm, I'm a young lad. I'm never going to go in and tell a Kelvin Scarry or Phil Clark or any of those guys, Dean Bell, right? This is how we should do it. Like, I, you just yeah. sit there and just shut up. And if they say, right, we're going out on a Thursday drinking, like, it doesn't matter what happened at home. You're going out drinking. Yeah. And if that becomes a, a Monday that goes all the way through to a Wednesday or Thursday, well, you know, strap yourself in because that's what's happening. That's what my peers are doing. When we first got into England, it was very much similar. We fell into Jason and Lol's way. Oh. And then, but know. that's the worst thing because I, 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 as a back, ended up, my, my best mates in the team were all forwards. Yeah. They've been drinking for years <laughs> and, and they had the, like, the, the frame to do it. I'm a little skinny rat and... I'm trying to keep up drink for drink with them. But it, so it's, it's hard. So you go through that period. The culture period, was good that week, wasn't it? Because you all looked after each other. I've had this conversation with you before in the fact that, you know, yes, it, it was that side where you go out and enjoy yourself because whether you like it or not, one of the parts, especially around rugby, is that social element yeah. and, and having pints and that's where your friendships are fully cemented. But you always said that it was a you had a good you had a good bond with it. They always had a good yeah. bond. But but it was performance first. Yeah. Well, Listen, you can go out every night. Players. If you if you didn't yeah. back it up, if you yeah. didn't do what you need to do on the pitch, then it just you know, the drinking didn't didn't really matter. But the great thing about Wigan was it wasn't just about winning. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It was because we had so many great players, so many world class players, like it was a consistent performance. Yeah. You go off the mark for a couple of games. The likelihood is you probably ne never get back yeah. in because there was so much competition for places. But that just drove everybody. I mean, just 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 growing up with the... the, the I, I, I see a few of the guys now, obviously, with like, the likes of Sean Edwards and Andy Farrell. And I see what they're doing now. And I see, whilst it's great what they're doing, I see where it all started. Yeah. And it was that it was that Wigan way. It was that mentality. It was a, the attention to detail. It was working hard. It was... You know, it was consistency in performance. It was just trying to bet yourself. Um, every time we went in the gym, who's the strongest? Who's the fastest? Who's the smartest? Wigan in, in, in itself was a great place, but there was a lot of expectation. Yeah. It wasn't just about, oh, well, can we win Wembley once? No, we, we won it eight years on the trot. Yeah. 
And then when you look at rugby and, and rugby league, and the, it's, it's tribal, it's bloody nasty. Like, <laughs> when you play for Wigan, everybody hated you. Everybody outside Wigan hated you. And I mean, hated you. Like, for me as well, as a, a young black guy, um, me and Martin Afire, oh, we used to get absolutely... And, you, and you're closest to the fans. Oh, man, <laughs> on the wing. That's why I love... Back in the day, the wingers used to... Especially, probably more so in rugby union, you're told to stay on your wing. There is not a chance <laughs> I am standing there because if they could reach you, they'd pull you into the crowd and yeah. give you a good idea. Yeah. I, that, that made me, the abuse made me go and looking for work in the middle. So I was always <laughs> sniffing around the middle as well to just because it, it, I mean, it was, it was brutal, but then it, it kind of toughened you up. It, was a, it gave you resilience to no matter what, who doesn't like me, what I come across, I'm going to get the job done. And we're going to shut the crowd up, and, and, and as a result, we did, and we, we just we made the 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 the, the, the success um, become our, our fuel, and we want to win it twice. We want to be the first team that's won it twice, three times, four times, five times, and if we don't do it, then like we'd be really really hard on ourselves. If we go through your league career. You just talked about winning it eight eight times at Wembley. Obviously, you went to World Cups, lost the semi final of the World Cup to Australia in the final. In the final, sorry, yeah. I meant the final. Um, did it get to the point, you obviously signed a contract in Australia that you didn't sort of go over to in the end, you, you could have done. Did it get to the point where you had sort of achieved everything and what made the change come about to switch to switch codes? How much did that weigh on your mind in terms of obviously it's a massive leap? Going, a, f a few leagues had done it before, before you. And, and you'd obviously dabbled in 96 played a couple of games, a few yeah. games for Bath, didn't you? Um, and you had the cross-codes game back then. So what led to the final decision to get, to, to switch over? Was it just to try something fresh? Yeah, well, I'd, it for so long? I changed sort of my lifestyle. And, you know, we were talking about um, Vaiga Twiga Marla before. But I'd gone from just going out and getting drunk all the time to all of a sudden, like, living a completely different lifestyle, clean lifestyle going to church, not drinking, and, and just having more of a focus on just getting me right, like physically, mentally. And and, and as a result of that, I felt I became a, a, a better player. I was more focused on what I was doing. You know, I was performing better, didn't wake, wasn't waking up with a hangover and, and going to training. Um, and then we just had so many years of, of you know, more, more success. And then I suppose it gets to a, a, a point with, with, with anybody where you look at your career and think, well, where am I at now? And I was 26, and for some reason I, I, I'd, uh, I was coming out um, my contract. My contract was up at the end of the year. You say it's bonkers that you're only 26 at this point. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> the, everyone would have thought you played, you know, you, well, I suppose you did play 10 years, but I was going to say 12, yeah. 13 so, years, but you still did 10. So at 26, I played 302 games. Um, before I switched to rugby union. But it was a case of, like, I knew myself I could still play for Wigan, like, without being big at it. I just knew, like, I could be playing this now for the next eight years quite quite easily. And then I had a little little bit of a taste, like you say, of, of rugby union at Bath for four months, but I thought that was more of a, a one-off thing, just because of rugby league, rugby union season changed over from, from winter to summer. So Just to let everyone know how far I heard a story about that when you play one of the games and obviously someone's put a kick behind and it's run into the uh, try area <laughs> and you've run it back out and actually all the the posh crowd at Bath go, no, 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 so you ran back in and put it down. It was a five minute scrum. Well, I, I, I often say that I didn't know anything about the game. <laughs> I really didn't know anything <laughs> about the game. So you're right, you know, the ball's been kicked and my natural reaction is, well, just run it. And I'm just, uh, just going into the end goal because you do that and you don't want to get yeah. caught and you're yeah, in goal. Yeah, yeah. So I pick it up, I start running out and the players go, like, no, 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 put it down. So then I'm running back into And it was like, oh, what do you want me to do here? <laughs> so I, I, they, they just realised, just don't say anything, just let me run. And, yeah. you know, quite a lot of the time, I, I look back now, it's so raw and I, I got caught and I didn't have a clue. But... There was a side of it that everybody thought they, they they tried to overthink. Well, they were just thinking, well, he's going to do this, and so they started turning their backs on it. Well, I've 
I, I caught so many people out because yeah. they just thought oh, he's going to do this, going to do no. And and I suppose that's why I made such an impact um, because when Clive Woodward later down the line rang me up and, and he started to explain about this was in 2000. I love rugby league. And I love the opportunities and playing for Wigan. But one thing that I hadn't done is really achieved at the international level. I didn't, it, was, it wasn't set up right. And I just saw this as an opportunity to uh, just try something new. You know, and, and there was no, there was nothing to say that was going to be successful. Just because, you, you know, there's other people that have tried and it's not worked. Um, but I just thought it's a great opportunity. And everybody thought, oh, he's coming for the money and that. But I was on less money. Um, playing for sale than I was at Wigan, you know. And uh, I just thought this is a, an opportunity to, you know, try something new and... Did Clive sell it well? Because obviously, he, coming off the back of 99 at that point, he's had to fight for his job. Mm. He's had to tell, look, don't judge me on 99, judge me on 2003. He's only been in for two years at that point. Um, did he sell it quite well in terms of what he... He did, if I'm honest, I wasn't quite sure what more I would be able to learn because rugby league it's always been professional yeah. we've always born full time just everything we're doing days just spent on getting your game right I always remember going to Bath and then you know it'd be a case of uh, guys have gone out to work and then we'd be training do you know what I mean it wasn't yeah. the same professionalism so I, I was a little bit sceptical but I just thought you know it's, it's kind of now or never and it, it must have sold it well because you know I didn't renew my contract with Wigan and uh, I made the switch over and I went to sale. If, if you look at the, the rise into, in, into rugby union for me, I made my first game for sale and it was a, it was a real shock because my first game for sale was against Coventry. 5th of November, we played against Coventry and there was 1,500 people there. And, and I think 1,200 people came because it was a free pint a pint. <laughs> And I think probably a thousand of those were Wigan fans coming to see what, what was happening. Um, but that first game, one of the guys I was playing against, he, he dyed his hair pink and I'm thinking, what am I doing here? Um, I got two touches of the ball. Um, I managed to score with one of them. So that was November the 5th. The following February, I'm playing for England. Came off the bench three times. In fact, no, I played, played England A in Wrexham. Walsh was at fullback at this I think point. Luke, I think might have been Dan Luke had got, so one of the guys got injured. So then I got called up into the first team, was on the bench. So I played three games off the bench. And then in June, I'm on a Lions tour. I played in the second game in the Lions tour and I scored five tries. And I think people then started to take yeah. me a little bit more seriously. And, uh, you know, it was... Uh, it was, it was yeah, a okay. it didn't, uh, it hadn't even dawned on me where it should do because I know my rugby well enough that yeah, yeah, you went 2001 when barely hadn't played, yeah. I didn't realise how complex the game was. In rugby league, we used to get stuck into rugby union. It's a, it's a game. Shouldn't be, you know, it, there was no other game other than rugby league when I grew up. And all of a sudden, when I made the switch and I started playing rugby union, I realised actually this is a tough game. Physically, it's tough. Mentally, like just tactically it's very very tough you know the ball's always alive people don't realize just mm -hmm. what do I do I'm up on my feet I'm up on my feet I'm on side um, so the great thing for me was with the England team and that Lions team like with the best players the England team you know that ended up winning the World Cup in 2003 reminded me a lot of the Wigan team because we had great players and we had players that didn't need to be told, oh, you need to do a bit more, you know, we're setting the bar. You didn't ask Johnny Wilkinson to do a bit more. Do you know what I mean? It was, we, we were all pushing each other. Yeah. You know, I came in and I, and I believe at the time, whilst I was raw and I needed a lot, you know, I was, I was saying, well, I, what do I do in the rock here? How do I do positional play? Where do I need to be? Um, it was good because I think everybody was learning from each other all the time and pushing each other. And, you know, Johnny Wilkinson, was like, look at his footwork and, so it was he, great. He, was, he always envied you, didn't he? So that's why he did all the extras that he did. He was trying to play catch up. But it was great because that, that's how it should be. You know, we, you, you can't be good at everything. So where we can learn, the, the worst thing you can do is be in an environment where you've got so much talent, whether it's bloody sport or business, and not tap into it. 
you know, it's not just about my game. If it's a team sport, it's like, how can we all get better? How can I help you? How can you help me? And, you know, being around you and the, like, and the rest of the boys just help me understand the game. Um, and then going on the Lions tour, I, I didn't know, I just didn't know who. It was probably a savior in many ways, because I think a lot of players come into, or, you know, come into an England team or go into a Lions, and they're a bit overawed by the whole occasion and names and that. The great thing for me is like, I didn't have a clue. I didn't know, know who Brian O'Driscoll was or Keith Wood or, I ain't got a clue. I was still trying to learn the names of the England players. Can we, can we clip they didn't know who Brian O'Driscoll was or send it to him? No, but I, I didn't have I a, like edges over didn't, didn't have a clue, but then end up rooming with him and sort of going on this journey and, yeah. you know, playing at the first test at the Gabba and I, pff, my mind was blown. You were an incredible, I, I still always tell the story of you doing one-arm pull-ups and you had like veins going around through your, your ribs and I was like, he's like a, he's like a horse. A Shetland pony, really, actually. More, <laughs> yeah, it? that's more. One. A really <laughs> in great Nick Shetland pony <laughs> that could that could sidestep. Do you feel that going into that, that's the best Nick you've ever been in? You know, yes, you've done a Lions tour, but you're now going into something that you know a massive global tournament. It's yeah, top five in the world. I think I've never trained as hard for anything um, before like that i mean we've we put physically like we got absolute beasted because yeah. remember in rugby league if i played into we played international rugby which would probably only be two or three games a year you wouldn't spend much time together all of a sudden that that year we must have spent about four a months together yeah. and and it really was physically we were all in we were all in great shape and we knew we needed to be you know one of the things we said is we want to be the fittest team the best prepared team but we were and you could see it you know Back in the day, probably years before, Jason Leonard, you know, would have been a bit bit heavier on his feet. But now we got, you know, him and Phil Vickery, you know, d doing pirouettes and sidestepping. And <laughs> do you know what I mean? Because everybody knew we we had to get better in some way. So I felt, with all the experience that I had from rugby league and where I was at, at the age, because I was 29 then, and I just felt like in really good mental, physical shape to take on, you know, one of the best teams in the world and. You know, but but not only that, just just felt really comfortable with the team that I was in because I knew we had everything we needed to be successful in that tournament. So uh, yeah, it was a, it was a great time, but it was one of those times where w w I mean, I remember looking at. Thankfully, we we won the World Cup, but I I don't know what we'd have done, where we'd have gone mentally, had that not happened because we. We made so many sacrifices. People are probably thinking, oh, what sacrifices? But we, like individual, family, you know, physical, like so many sacrifices because everybody had the, the, the eye on the prize. Everybody wanted the same goal. You know, the, 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 the kit men, the nutritionists, everybody was there. Like, we need to do everything possible to get to Australia and to bring that trophy back. Yeah, it is a good job we won it. But then you go on, you end up being captain of England. Yeah, and that, that was, I didn't fully understand the magnitude of it. And Johnny Wilkinson was supposed to get the, uh, the, the, the not as captain, but he got injured. And then uh, Andy Robinson came to me and said, look, you know, I want you to be the captain. And, and I didn't say yes straight away. I, I thought, I've, I've got to think about this because this is a big, big thing. And it was one of the, it was a transitional period for him. It was a tough, tough time. And I said yes. And you know something, I look back now and think, wow, that was a, was a fantastic honour. But I didn't realise everything else around it. I knew, um, you know, I, I'd become the first men's black captain for England, but I didn't realise just how many people it affected. I didn't realise the significance of it. It was only sort of after, because as a player, you know, you, you, you win stuff, you get stuff, you, you, you just keep looking forward. You don't have time to really dwell. If you get the captaincy, it's right, okay, I've got to deliver now. There's certain things, it's not just about performing on the field. Now I've got to try and galvanise a team. I've got to, you know, do all the stuff that comes with being a captain. And your focus is more about that than any achievement. Yeah. You know, because it's, it's a huge responsibility. England lose. I, I, I still feel now, if you're the captain, you take it harder than most of the players because you're the one that's doing yeah, the press yeah. conferences you're yeah. you're the one that has somehow do you know what I mean you, yeah. you, I, I think you get judged more as, as, as a captain but you know what an opportunity especially when I 
when I think about where it all started, didn't know anything about Rugby Union. I'm here at Onslaught Club. And I, little me, went from living in one of the most deprived areas to not just going through one sport, to go into another sport, which was not just a different sport, different class. You know, it was a, <laughs> it was a massive culture shock for me. And then end up being, you know, England captain. Yeah, I mean, that, that would be the, big, the biggest sort of thing is, I think the, there were always been black people playing rugby, but the, the schooling and everything is, like rugby is always posh school sort of based. Whereas you sort of set the trend on not coming in the usual way. That's like, you know, and is what rugby hasn't been, rugby union hasn't been good at for a long time, is going somewhere else to find your talent. Yeah. It's normally the schools that provide the talent. And I think that was the, I think that's one of the biggest impacts that you made. Is uh, it? And, that, and that's why, you know, one of the things I do now, especially around these areas is, 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 is come back in. Yeah. And most kids around here won't have a clue what rugby union is. But surely, if we're looking to grow the game in rugby union, you know, at grassroots level, you know, and, and provide the best players at, in the top tier, surely you have to come. And if, 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 if I've done that from this area, how many more kids could there be yeah, yeah. given an opportunity to go and do, do something? Do you know what I mean? Or at least like build a pool, build a, the, the grassroots pool to give us more. So for me, it's a must because there's a lot of talent around here. They just need nurturing. And there will be a lot of kids in here that, you know, don't know whether to run out the in goal. Hunslet and back, Club to HQ. Listen, it's amazing what, what talent there is in, in, in areas. And uh, it just, you know, sometimes we just need a, a pat on the back and just say, you know, you're quite good at that. And it's amazing where you can get to. Well, Jace, thanks. I think it's amazing what you're doing at, at grassroots level. You know, having kids myself who try and force down, which you know, to rugby club all the time as well. Forced out. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't really. <laughs> I'm just waiting until Lucas is old enough. They've got to go. That was the deal I made with them. They've got to play rugby until Lucas is old enough to go there. Right. So at least he spends Sundays down there as well. But thank you for your time. Um, I think it's amazing and always a pleasure to see you. Good to see you. Right, kids. Yes. Thank you.